Sometimes dead is better. Huh, <sighs> just joking. Zombies are awesome. So here we go, horror fans. We have another adaptation of a Stephen King novel, and this one is Pet Cemetery. It's Horror Month 2018, and we decided to do some more Stephen King stuff. So, why not one of his greatest books ever written, Pet Cemetery? Okay, so this is going to be sort more of a personal review uh, of mine on here this year for Horror Month because I just recently finished reading at Pet Cemetery. Now, I read the book way back in grade school because I was reading Stephen King when I was in grade school. I don't remember what grade I was in. And I actually have the original, I don't have the cover, um, book right here of Pet Cemetery. This is the book that I read when I was in grade school. And back when I was in grade school, I used to write on the inside of the cover. So let's take a look, shall we, at what I wrote. It says, um, it, I even wrote in here how long it took me to, to read the book, from December 25th to January 16th, because my parents actually got this for me for Christmas that year. So I wrote, so I wrote in here, the best book of Kings yet, number one, <laughs> super great, I had a nightmare about it, the greatest book. Better than Cujo, I put in here. Um, I hope they make a movie of it, I wrote. And the last one is one of the greatest books of the year. I mean, the thing is literally falling apart. I mean, I can barely hold on to it, so I don't really want to mess with it too much. But yeah, I mean, that's how much this, this, this book meant to me. And all these years later, I went back and reread this book. And as, as a big reader, you know, I don't reread books. I don't think I, this. I don't think I've ever actually went back and reread a book that I've read. So this was the first book I ever read twice, which is weird. And I read it all those years ago because you actually, after you read it, you were like, "Do you want to read it?" Now I'm like, "Yeah, I'd love to read it," uh, but I, there was no way, I, especially at that time, because I think we were, I believe we were, in seventh grade at that point. It was either sixth or seventh grade, and I remember before that, you one of the other books that you had gotten was Christine, and I remember looking at your your book of Christine, and it had because the movie of Christine was coming out, and it, of course it had, you know, the the one that you see from the poster where Christine's you, you see her lights on and it's it's all blue and you just see the outline of the front of the car and all that kind of thing, so I remember when that. When that movie was coming out, you you picked up the book and you were like, "Man, this is a great book!" And you were reading through the book and everything and showing it to me. So then, when it came to Pet Cemetery, I remember you telling me about it and like, "Oh my gosh, there's this, this there's this guy named Victor Pascal in there, and Victor Pascal keeps coming back to him." And <laughs> and I remember you telling me all about this. So finally, you let me borrow it, and that's how I got to read it the first time around. I, eventually, I finally did find the book and I bought it for myself because I wanted to go ahead and read it again. The first time I ever read it was because you let me borrow the book and I remember sitting there at night in my bed reading this book before I would fall asleep. I, I don't know how I did it. I don't know how I actually made made it through that book <laughs> without necessarily, I mean I got scared, I got spooked and whenever I did I would put the book down and say well I can't read that anymore. I'll have to wait till tomorrow. You know and then I would go back the next night and, and read it again. But I guess it was just because it, it, it helped me to wind down at night and, and then fall asleep. But I never had a nightmare from it. I never had anything like that. But I finally got through the whole book and it was one of the best reads I think I've ever had. I mean, it was one of my favorite books of all time is Pet Cemetery. So when I read this as a kid, I mean, you're a kid, you're reading this and it doesn't really have that much of a impact. But now when you read it as an adult, it's it's a completely different book um, it really is and the book is brilliant it is so well written and I really literally became obsessed with reading this book again I listened to it in my car I actually had it on audio tape I listened to it in my car I listened to it at home I listened to it any any time I could listen to it 
and I was sitting there just nonstop talking about it. And it's like discovering it for the first time again. And I wanted to talk about it to people, and they're like, Pet Cemetery, that came out in the 80s. Who cares about that anymore? And I was like, it's still incredible. It's still amazing. And it's like, you know, I rediscovered it, and I want to talk about it so bad to people, and nobody cares about it anymore. And it's like, ugh. I think part of it was because they made the movie, and, and a lot of this happens with Stephen King's books that become movies. It says once it becomes the movie, well, people that didn't read the book, you know, or didn't want to read the book, or, or, or they knew of Stephen King, but they, you know, they knew he made the he made the book. They, eventually, they they don't read it, and then they go and see the movie, and they're like, oh, well, I've seen it, I know all about it, so there's no reason to pick up the book. I couldn't remember the movie because I seen it originally when it very first came out, whatever year this thing came out, and I probably haven't seen it since then. And after reading this book, I was like, there's no way. There's absolutely no way they could have transferred this book into film and make it anywhere around the level of greatness this book is. And you know what? They didn't. They absolutely could not touch the greatness of this book to putting it in a film. They didn't do it. And, and that's also kind of the problem with the, the stories that they've taken from Stephen King and made into movies is they don't... I mean, the movies end up being basically cliff notes to his books. A lot of them have done that. The Shining did that. Cujo did that. Christine did that. I mean... I think Cujo actually was probably the closest adaptation to any of his books. It's pretty much the book. The Shining is not the book. Uh, Christine is not the book. The only thing the same as in Christine in the book is the car. That's it. There, there, there's so many... It's not anywhere around the book. Same thing with Shining is they had the characters in there, but it, I read the book of The Shining, and it wasn't that movie. It wasn't even remotely that, not that, the, I mean, The Shining is one of the greatest horror films of all time, but it wasn't the book. And But when they came to Pet Cemetery, they tried to make it like the book. Well, <laughs> and what you said is exactly right. Okay, well, we got this scene. We got It's, it's sort of like the... Um, the Nightmare on Elm Street remake. We got this scene, and we got to have that in there. We got to have this scene in there, and have this scene in there, and this scene in there, because people are expecting to see those scenes. The rest of it, we don't care about. You know, the character creations and the emotional impact, and all, we threw all that out, and just gave us sort of the okay, this is what happens in the book, and the end. So when I reviewed it last year, that is a perfect Stephen King adaptation. That was the book. That was what I was expecting. And I'm hoping, because the people who did that are doing this again. This is actually coming out next year as a remake. And I'm, if they remake it like the book, it'll be one of the most disturbing films anyone has ever watched, ever. Yeah, and uh, I recently got to finally see the, the new Stephen King's It. And, yeah, I, everything I saw on there was exactly from what I remembered of the book, which I read years ago. But... Yeah, pretty much everything that happened in there was right from the book. No, Pet Cemetery doesn't do that, but it has the basics of what the story was, and that's. And what's really weird is Stephen King often is the one that does the screenplays for these. So I believe he did the screenplay for this, if I'm not mistaken. So here you have the exact author actually taking things out of his screenplay for the movie. Okay, so I don't want to keep comparing the book to the movie, but there is one major scene that if they did remake it today, I, it would be so disturbing and so creepy that, I mean, I, I would love to see it. I'd love to see what they'd be able to do with this today. But back then, obviously, they didn't have the effects to, to do it, was when Gage comes back. And in the movie, he's just this little uh, kid running around and, and he has like a little cut on his forehead. In the book, it was not like that. Not, not like that at all. He actually got his head cut off in the book. Uh, let me let me say this. All right. If anybody watched our Jaws the Revenge the re review, I had a little story in there, and I talked about having the book to Jaws Revenge and having lost that book. And when I went and asked my teacher about it because I lost it in class, she announced it to everyone in the class that I lost that book. Well, there was this jock that said, well, why don't you just go see the movie? And one of the things I said to him, well, there's, that's because there's things that happen in the book that don't happen in the movie. 
and it's the same here as with Pet Cemetery. There's lots of stuff that happened in the book that don't happen in the movie, but you also have to understand that some of the stuff that you can write in a book, it translates as a book, and not necessarily it would translate as a film. You know, it wouldn't come across the same way, or you might not have the same feeling that you did with the book. Well, unless you are a talented writer and talented filmmaker, it, you know, and you know what you're doing, it, that, yeah, you can. I totally can see this as a great film. I can totally see this as somebody trying to take this book and turning it into that book. So one of the most disturbing scenes, besides the Gage thing, was the talk of uh, her sister in, in the book. Wow. I mean, I gotta tell you, Vince, I, I don't mind squ squeamish stuff. I've watched so many horror movies. I've seen so many disgusting. I've read so many gross things. That disturbed me. That entire sequence in the book was so well written that I almost couldn't read it. It was so bad and so disgusting and so horrible that I almost just ran it through and not read that part. And I never do that. It was that bad. I was just like, holy crap. It's like Stephen King had to have known somebody who had that disease. And that person must have told him every single little detail, or that, or he looked it up or something, because it was horrible. It was horrible. In the movie, it's in there. Is it as bad as the book? No. It's probably five, probably two percent of what the book was. <laughs> uh, to be very honest with you, the very first time I saw this movie, that was one of the parts of the movie that frightened me. That was one of the parts of the movie that was that, like you, it made me squeamish. Squeamish. It made me disturbed to, to see it. And it's because it, the way it's done in the film. And having Denise Crosby voice over exactly what was going on, the way she tells the story, that's what makes it squeamish. And that brings me to this, is people who don't read, he probably has never read this book and has only ever seen the movie, I'm sure they probably will enjoy the movie. Is it a bad movie? No. It's an, it's an okay film. I mean, there's nothing really wrong with the movie. It's well acted. I mean, and of course, I got to mention Judd in the film, which was um, Fred Gwynn, one of the best actors there ever was, and he never really got a chance that much to act because he was stereo. He was in the in the stereo type of Herman Munster. I mean, he made movies like uh, My Cousin Vinny and things like that. But when he actually had the chance to act, this guy was the phenomenal actor. He was the the actor. I mean, he, he, I wish he, they would have given him a chance to be in more things. And I can tell you when I was reading the book, I couldn't get him out of my mind. It was like if Stephen King wrote that character for him. He was that character. It, it was written for him. Well, there's actually something that he said, and uh, once we get to the extras here, uh, we can talk a little bit about that, but there was actually something that Fred Gwynn himself said about the character that that actually kind of changes what you just said because it, yeah it you could kind of see that that maybe you know Stephen King would would have probably had him in mind to to be the character but I hi highly doubt it I I'm sure he just wrote this as the a, an old person that lives across the street because actually one of the things in the extras that we'll talk about is some of this stuff actually was taken from Stephen King's real life. For just a film by itself, it's okay. It's not a bad little horror movie. And I would give it a four out of five. It doesn't quite creep me out now because I've seen it since then. But overall, I've enjoyed the movie for years. I think it's actually one of Stephen King's better films. and. I would give it a 5 out of 5. Okay, so now we're doing the extras for Pet Cemetery. And we're doing these extras from this Blu-ray of Pet Cemetery, by the way. Uh, it's got this kind of plain cover on it. <laughs> It's not very impressive. Okay, so the audio commentary 
uh, is not bad. It's okay, but it's just Mary Lambert. And there's parts where she pauses. There's parts where, you know, she's not really talking. But overall, it wasn't a bad commentary. I mean, she talks a lot about what happened on the set and and how they filmed things and who they picked to, to play the parts, like Miko uh, playing uh, Gage and uh, Denise Crosby playing the wife and Judd Crandall and the whole thing. So it was interesting, but nothing spectacular. So the actual first extra is called Stephen King Territory. Now, this is sort of like some of the other movies we reviewed this month that I knew nothing about this film. So it was interesting to hear about how they made the film. And they actually made this in Maine, where Stephen King lives. And they actually made it like three blocks down from his actual house. So he was always on the set. He was always walking down there on the set. Yeah, and I thought that was pretty cool. But it was also part of the, I guess, the contract about them making the movie was they had to make sure that they made it in Maine, which the director, once again, Mary Lambert, was completely fine with that because she was like, yeah, that it makes sense and we can find some really beautiful you know scenery and beautiful houses and all of this to, to put in the film and they actually found a, a, a decent nice house for the creeds as well as a nice house across the street where they actually did have to build a facade around for Judd Crandall's house so it was pretty cool and you had the road going between them and Stephen King was actually on here, which you never see. I don't think I've ever seen him on an actual extra. Any movie that is his, he's never on. He never comes on and talks about it. He don't care. It seems like he signs the contract, and then here's the movie. Do whatever you want with it. But, uh, yeah, he actually was on here, I guess, because he lived right down the street. And he walked around, and he talked, and he showed you the path that they built, and the cemetery he was actually in, and the deadfall, and all of it. It was really kind of cool to actually see him in an extra, finally. It's a decent extra. I wouldn't say it's anything spectacular again, but it, there is a lot of interesting stuff in there. And of course, to see Stephen King walking around talking about the film and talking about his actual experiences, because this was actually stuff that happened during his life. He actually wrote all this stuff down because this is actually things that were happening. Yeah, everything that was in this book actually happened to Stephen King. So if you're wondering where does he get his ideas, this is it. I mean, he basically wrote everything that was happening to him. He was a school teacher, like Vince said, and rented out this house. There was a house right across the street with an old man, and he said the old man came across the street and he says, you know, this road eats up your, your pets, so you better be careful, you know not to get your pets run over, and then what happens? I think his daughter's cat gets run over in, in the road. Then they talk to him about the pet cemetery, and he goes up to there, to the pet cemetery, and it's actually, on the on the other disc they talk about, it's spelled, it's misspelled like the, the cover, and that's how he spelled it, was from the actual sign above the pet cemetery. All of this was real. Everything in this actually happened to him, except for, obviously, the stuff come back from the dead. That was his own imagination. So yeah, I don't think Victor Pascal followed uh, Stephen King around, but who knows. <laughs> so up next is an extra called The Characters, and this is basically the director talking about her career and where she came from and how she got this job. And Lewis Creed was on here talking about how he got the job. Uh, Denise Crosby was not on here, and I got to talk a little bit about her for a minute. Now, I, at that point when this movie came out, I was a huge, huge Next Generation fan. I watched it every Saturday at 10.30. I was in front of the, of the TV, never missed an episode. I think it was on for seven years. I watched every single week, every night at 10.30. I think it was on Channel 4, and never missed, never missed an episode. One of my favorite shows of all time. And then she left off the show. I didn't really like her that much on the show anyway. But she ended up leave, leaving off the show because she wanted to be a actor. She wanted to go into movies and actually become a real actor. And a lot of the Star Trek fans got upset about it. But that's the reason she quit the show was to do this movie. I mean, I watched Star Trek The Next Generation and I never really thought about her character other than 
Star Trek. <laughs> you know, I never really paid much any of attention to her character anyway. So, like you said, when she left, this really no big deal. So, you know, and then she started doing movies. Well, okay, <laughs> you know. Yeah, but it, it made the Star Trek fans very upset, which I can see why. Uh, it would be like saying you're watching a Star Wars TV show and Luke Skywalker's like, yeah, I've had it. I'm leaving. I'm going to go become an actor. And I'm going to go make this movie. <laughs> Screw you guys. So, yeah, you, you would probably get upset. The other thing they talk about in here is the cast and, and who got cast to play these different parts. I've never really knew a whole lot about all the behind the scenes stuff and who got cast and how they got cast and all that kind of thing and that's what this extra is mostly about. The, the girl that plays Ellie in the movie was actually twins. So the character of Gage, the baby, was actually played by Miko and Miko <laughs> not only went to play this character, but later on he ended up playing in Wes Craven's New Nightmare. It was actually interesting because they had Fred Gwynn there when he bites Fred Gwynn's Judge Crandall's neck. Fred actually played with him and got him to, okay, you gotta bite me here and, uh, you know, just, you know, don't really bite me, but, you know, just play with, and he got him to play with him so that when it came time to film that scene, Miko was able to do the scene and it actually looks like he's biting into his neck. I think he was the weakest character in the whole thing. I hated that kid in this. I hated him in New Nightmare. I'm glad he quit acting. And the other thing they do in here is a tribute to Fred Gwynn. They talked about him uh, on the, being on the set and uh, they had Lewis, the guy that played Lewis Creed in there, talking about him and his experiences with him. They had Vic, the guy that plays Victor Print. Pascal in here talking about his experiences with him and it was probably the coolest part of this extra I have to say and one of the things that Fred Gwynn said and this is probably what I was saying might change the kind of the outlook on this was that he told the director I fit into this role like a pair of pants that this role was made for me and that's why I need to play it he was destined to play this role and he knew it and he totally accepted it and he was the best part of the movie so the last extra is called filming the horror and it's mostly the director and she's on there talking about how she directed the film and, and it's not that great but the one extra on there and they go into a whole lot more detail on this um separate disc is how they built the outside to that other house and if you're watching the movie, you would have never known that in a million years. You would just think, oh, it's just, a, it's just a house. But no, they didn't like the look of it, and they wanted Judd Crandall's house to be much larger and creepier looking. So they literally built a house on top of a house. So the whole outside of that house is a different house. It's just crazy that, you know, stuff that Hollywood does. It, yeah, it was a facade. It wasn't, it, they built the whole side and, and front of the house, all the parts that they were filming, they they. That's what they, they built around this other house because the other house was like a cottage and it was really nice looking and it didn't look as, as old and uh, dilapidated or creepy. So that's what they wanted to kind of make it look like it was lived in by Judd and his wife, who they ended up cutting out of the movie anyway. <laughs> so as extras go, I was kind of impressed by it. I, I didn't, wasn't expecting, first of all, I wasn't expecting Stephen King to be on there. And I wasn't expecting some of the stuff they talked about to be on there either, that you actually found out stuff that I never knew. But yeah, it wasn't a bad extra. But then I actually went out and bought this because we were going to review this this year, which we don't have time. It's called, like I said, Unearthed and Untold, the making of Pet Cemetery, And it's sort of like the thing that we bought last year, which never got around to editing, which was the making of Creepshow. It was called Just Desserts. They actually came out with a, a whole disc about the making of Creepshow. And this was actually really good. If you want to know more details about everything that, you know, that the movie, uh, that th this didn't say. Like, for example, I was telling you that the Pet Cemetery sign was an actual sign. And they had the woman on there whose son painted the sign. Because they built that Pet Cemetery in town. And she's like, well, I think we need a sign. So her kid went and painted the sign and spelt it wrong. And she's like, oh, that's perfect. Hung it up above the, the, the thing. And when Stephen King was living there, he saw the sign, and that's, again, the misspelling of, of the cover. That's where the sign actually came from, was a real sign. So, yeah, this was a pretty good 
disc overall. I, I I wasn't necessarily blown away by all the extras, but it was interesting, and it was it wasn't anything that was terrible or anything. I mean, it was interesting to find out all of this stuff, especially like David and I. We have never really heard anything behind the scenes about Pet Cemetery, so in that respect, it, 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 that's why it was entertaining for us. There you go. There is yet another Stephen King movie under our belts here for Horror Month. And eventually, maybe we can work our ways through all of the movies and bring you, at some point, every Stephen King movie ever released. And that was one of our things we were going to do at one point, but we haven't yet done that. But we're slowly knocking them down, so... This is one that we can check off the list. That's it for Box Office Maniacs for Horror Month 2018, for, or at least this review. But to see more, you have to subscribe. So go ahead and subscribe to Box Office Maniacs so that you can continue to watch more and more Stephen King stuff and more and more horror films and more and more of the stuff that we're bringing you all month long.